everybody. My name is Nadia Samur. Um, I've um, participated in this uh, project um, called Toolkit for Toolkit for Activists. Um, it is a toolkit that you can download. Um, we will talk about it later in more in depth. Um, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, and um, half of my clients are in prison. So what we're going to present later is something that I work with uh, on an everyday basis. Uh, my name is Melanie Brazel, and uh, I'm originally from the States. So is the concept of transformative justice. So we come together. Um, but I've lived in Berlin for the last 10 years, and I've been very involved in the Transformative Justice Collective. Um, and particularly, we work on alternatives to policing and prison for sexual violence and intimate partner violence. So that's some of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, yeah, these are not easy topics, so take care of yourself. If you're on heavy drugs, this might not be the workshop for you. Ah, yeah. Okay, so um, as Nadia was saying, basically uh, part of what we want to present today is um, the results of, well, 10 years of collaboration and work um, that kind of resulted in a project called the What Really Makes Us Safe project. Um, and this was a project that brought together folks that were working um, both on addressing sexual violence and partner violence and also folks that were addressing state violence, so police brutality, um, whoa. Sorry. Border yeah, border regimes, prisons, abolishing prisons, bringing those folks together to contribute. And uh, as Nadia said, the, the book is uh, available for download on our website. We'll give you all of our information at the end of this workshop. Um, and it's going to be released, it's going to be published as like a book proper in August from uh, Edition Assemblage. So you can also buy it from them. Um, and we are also encouraging this summer, we're kind of going on tour and taking the book out on tour around uh, different places in Germany. We we're also just in London. So we're really encouraging people to think about the title, which is what really makes us safe. And actually encouraging people to like post and, and uh, talk about, you know, what are the things that are sold to us as the things that are supposed to make us safe actually make our lives more dangerous um, and our world more dangerous. So. I will, uh, I just want to also dedicate this workshop today to um, Hussam F. Some of you might know that uh, in Berlin there was an, uh, Hussam was an Iraqi refugee who um, actually, his daughter was being harassed in, they, they were living in Tempelhof, you said, in the, in the refugee camp in Tempelhof. His daughter was being harassed, he called the police um, to come and help and protect his daughter and then actually he was murdered by the police. Um, and the case was originally dropped, uh, and um, several of the organizations that we partnered with that are published in the book, um, COP and Reach Out, have organized a campaign to get that case reopened um, and to get justice for Hussam F. And they've been successful, actually. So we just want to dedicate the workshop to him and his memory and his family. Yeah, sure. We so we want to start with a really basic exercise. Uh, we're going to ask you guys to take a few minutes to think about these questions um, around the issue of safety. So uh, the first question is, what does the state say makes me safe? And uh, here, you know, the state, we can also think about what corporations tell me are supposed to make me safe, what my family told me growing up, what the schools told me. Um, and then ask yourself, what do I feel really makes me safe? And if I feel, if I notice any differences or similarities between those two things. So I'm going to invite you to think about these and to actually turn to the person next to you for like two, three minutes and just share a little bit of your thoughts around those questions. Yeah, so meet someone new, talk to your neighbor, and then we'll come back.
Geht vor? Nee, oder? Deine geht vor. No, that's the long one. So I think we should start again. Or do you want to turn yours back? Okay. Finish that thought. That was quick. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I hope you had a great conversation with your neighbor. So what this is about is to show you um, a seeming and a actual gap between what is sold to us as safety and what actually really makes us safe, what we need uh, as, you know, uh, what meets our needs of safety. Um, this is because we are observing a certain phenomenon. The state tells us um, that punishment, in particular police, uh, the border regime, uh, prisons, all these aspects of punishment, um, these, uh, these are being sold as safety to us. But those things actually do the opposite. Um, they create more violence and more unsafety. Um, this is because in our society, uh, punishment is particularly used against marginalized people, in particular poor people and racialized people. Um, this is in order to cement um, a certain order um, that we live in, which we perceive as a capitalist uh, and racist order, and also as a sexist order, which we are going to be talking about later uh, in depth. And this is also to create um, or to maintain the monopoly on the use of force, um, the m monopoly of violence of the state. Um, and the increased punishment, increased punishment policies is on the rise um, in the West in particular. Um, this is um, really part of a really long history um, dating back to uh, post-World War II developments um, and we, we've, you've probably all heard about law and order policies. This is to, um, this is really corral correlates with um, the decrease of um, social welfare um, policies and an increase of more police, more punishment, uh, and more criminalization. You've also probably heard about a phenomenon in the US called the prison industrial complex. Uh, here in Germany, if you ask me, um, I wouldn't say that we are there yet. Um, surely there are developments into that direction, there are tendencies, uh, but what we are observing here is what I call a hard sphere industrial complex, because Germany is obsessed with prevention, um, and so the, the part of the, the, the punishing part um, of the carceral state has been moved to you know, to, um, to anything that happens before an actual crime happens. So if you are aware of job center sanctions, um, of um, control and observation and um, disciplining people, particularly jobless people, poor people, racialized people, um, this is where it all starts. And this is, these are the developments that we are observing in Germany. Um, <laughs> right. And not to forget the border, Fortress Europe, um, all the debates that are happening at the moment of um, closing borders, controlling refugees, deporting them back to uh, unsafe places. This, is, um, this plays into um, the increase and uh, the increase of carceral, system, carceral policies in Germany. Um, so of course, this is something that we do not consider to be safe, but we do need we do want to acknowledge needs of safety. And maybe this is something uh, we should be aware of. And Ger in German, Sicherheit is the same word. Um, but what we mean in, in English, if we use safety, it is not the same as security. So security is the institutionalized idea of carceral policies, of controlling people, of, of disciplining people, of punishing people, whereas safety is a personal need. Um, that every individual and also collectives and communities um, are entitled to have. Um, so, we asked ourselves, what would really make us safe? Um, our goal was to analyze the situation with state and sexual violence in Germany and look at transformative justice alternatives.
So again, as this is a workshop, we prepared a tiny um, exercise for you. Um, because there is a gap between safety and security, and because there is a gap between what is considered to be criminal and what is considered to be harmful, we would like to ask you to think about these questions. How many times have you broken the law in the last week or weeks? How many times have you crossed the street on a red light? How many times have you insulted somebody, maybe a person um, with authority, like what we call Beamtenbeleidigung in German? How many times have you traveled without an ID or without a ticket uh, on public transportation? Just go through the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and, how and have you been caught or punished for this? Have you or have you not? Why or why not? What does it have to do with your own position of power in society? What causes people to be controlled? What causes people to pass, um, for example, police control? without any harm, um, right. Yeah, just take a minute or two to talk about this with your neighbor. And then I'll flip it and we'll do the circles. Yeah, I was counting the circles. Yeah, and the right. transition. All right, let's wrap it up. So maybe, maybe the outcome of your short interaction was that you felt actually there is a difference between harm and crime. But keep in mind, like all these things are actually crimes. They're criminalized in the German legal system. But are they really harmful? So. I think it's essential to differentiate between crime and harm um, and to then think about who gets punished for what and who does not get punished for certain things. And as you see, we do acknowledge that one, like on the one side, there is a difference between crime and harm. Um, certain things are criminalized, but uh, they aren't harmful, really. 
there are like crimes without victims, but there are also things that are harmful and aren't criminalized. Um, for instance, our everyday reality, like the everyday reality of, ser of some people who need to work two to three jobs just to make a living, which is very harmful for their health, but this is not criminalized, of course. But what we are here for today and why we want to talk with you about transformative justice is that there is another thing we need to pay attention to, which is the overlap of things or behavior that is criminal and harmful at the same time. And of course, as people who do, cr who do criticize um, the carceral state, punishment, prisons, border regime, because they are oppressive and violent, we also need to acknowledge that there are certain questions certain acts of violence that we have to have a reaction towards and that we need to demand accountability for. And this is why Mel is going to um, introduce to us the concept of transformative justice. So I, I think what's important is one thing to notice that usually uh, the powerful aren't held accountable for times that they uh, break the law or hurt people. And usually the less people who have less power in society are more often held accountable for breaking the law or for harming people. And a lot of times when we talk about getting rid of state violence, getting rid of punishment, getting rid of police, getting rid of prisons, abolishing all of that, that sounds great. We can get rid of that top circle where things are criminalized. The problem is that as a society, we still have that bottom circle, which is that we hurt each other. Right? So what are we going to do when we hurt each other if we're trying not to use the systems that we've inherited, that we've um, learned and been socialized into around punishing each other um, and around using uh, state power to do that? So uh, transformative justice really came out of um, the inter two different movements. Right. So I'm going to speak uh, here about, about U.S. history but you can make, uh, and U.S. social movements, but you can make some parallels to the German case. So what you had were two different movements, uh, the movement against state violence and the movement against sexual violence. And in both of these movements, these movements weren't intersectional enough. They weren't thinking about each other. So what you had on the one hand was a movement against state violence uh, really focused, like I was talking about abolishing prisons and police, talking about police brutality. I'm sure you guys, if you watch the news, are seeing more and more um, all of the police violence in the US that's being exposed. Um, and obviously that the powerful are not held to account for the things, the harm that they do. Um, but a lot of what was happening in that movement is that people were like, yeah, we're going to get rid of police and prisons and that's going to be the end of our problem. And what you had was a lot of, uh, especially women of color, black women in those movements saying, wait, actually we still have like rape, abuse, harm, violence happening even within our activist community. Right? How are we, I'm, I don't want to call the police on my partner, how am I going to deal with that? We can get rid of the state, but how are we going to deal with each other? Right? So making that critique of the movements against state violence for not thinking enough about gender. And then on the other side, what we have is a feminist movement um, that, you know, especially in the US increasingly, uh, since the 1980s and, and 1990s has, has really allied itself with the state. Right? So the feminist movement getting mainstream, creating rape crisis centers, women's shelters. And in order to get some of the resources for those movements, uh, they really started to work closely with the state and say, you know, locking people up in prisons for harming their partners and their children, that's the way to go. That's the solution. Right? So we call this in the US increasingly, uh, transformative justice activists have been criticizing this and calling this carceral feminism. You may have heard the term carceral uh, Nadia was using before. Carceral is just a fancy word related to the word incarceration, which means imprisonment. And when we talk about carceral, we mean any system that's limiting people's mobility, right? These systems are often racialized. So they target specific racialized groups and limit their mobility to move, right? So we're talking about prisons, but we're also talking about uh, psychiatric institutions. We're talking about, in the US, um, uh, reservations for indigenous people, the mission system, um, obviously slavery and the plantation system, a, a long legacy of, of systems that limit the movement of certain people and control them. So uh, 
what happened in the US, and you can see parallels definitely in Germany, is that the movement, the feminist movement in particular, became more and more white, more and more mainstream, more and more middle class uh, women. And uh, part of the intervention of transformative justice was women of color, black women, queer folks of color, trans people of color saying, actually, when people come in and need help from me, when they come in and say that my, my partner is abusing me or you know, I, need to, I, I need support, um, sending them to the police can actually cause them more harm than good. There's a lot of people for whom calling the police, if they have a case of interpersonal violence in their lives, can actually get them deported. If they're working uh, as a sex worker, they can be imprisoned for that. Um, they might lose their children, right? There are crazy laws in the US that actually punish women who aren't able to leave abusive relationships and they say that they're committing child abuse. A lot of these women also can't leave because they, we don't have a social welfare network anymore, a social welfare system, right? So they don't have the money to uh, get their own place. We also know, you know, a lot of, um, uh, there's not a lot of affordable housing, right? So basically what you had was, uh, women of color, queer folks of color, trans folks of color, making an intervention into both of these movements and saying you both need each other. You're both not looking at what the other one sees. You can't fight state violence without addressing sexual violence. And you can't address sexual violence using state violence because the state actually facilitates violence and makes it possible, right? We also know that uh, so much sexual violence is created by the current border regime. Right? What the border regime does is systematically expose people, especially women and children, to sexual violence and abuse. Right? It, we know that a lot of sexual violence happens in prisons, and it's also done by agents of the state. Right? Hospitals, psychiatry, all of these institutions expose people to sexual violence. So the state cannot actually be our answer. It can't be our vision. We can't just call the cops. That's not our solution. So. I, I, wanna do, I do wanna make a connection with uh, Germany because I think that we're seeing some of these things happening in Germany as well. And that's something that we talk about in the book. And we use the word uh, Strafrechtsfeminismus as our kind of translation of this idea of carceral feminism. And maybe some of you have noticed um, that uh, the AfD recently is like really, really interested in protecting women and children and that right, the right wing people are really using this issue of protecting women from violence and sexual violence um, and doing these like women's marches that they claim are about women's safety, right? Obviously that's not our vision of safety. Our vision of safety is not a paternalist protector that comes in uh, and says, I'll take care of you. Our vision of safety is about self-determination and empowerment for survivors. So we wanna make a really strong division there. Um, and another issue that we look at very much in the book is um, many of you know that after the attacks, the sexual violence that happened in Köln at, 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 um, at Silvesta, like I think it was two years ago now, or was that three? Almost three years. Um, after that, maybe you guys also remember that suddenly the conservatives were really, really interested in Sexualstrafrecht. They were really interested in the definition of sexual violence and they really wanted to pass a law uh, that feminists and progressives had been pushing for a really long time to change the law, the definition of sexual violence, from one that's based on force to one that's based on consent, right? And all of a sudden, conservatives are interested in this, but only for one reason, because the perpetrators are being portrayed as men of color, right? So all of this, you know, we call this like femonationalism, all carceral feminism, all of this is instrumentalizing protecting women and children in order to further a racist politics that portrays a certain group of people as a greater danger, right? So um, I guess I will turn this over to you to say a few more things about this. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'll, I'll include that later. Okay. So, yeah, well, Mel has already um, talked about, yeah, the, uh, our idea and our critique of course of feminism and this phenomenon of pitting communities against each other and pitting safety needs against each other um, can be also observed in other uh, in, in, in the broader society as such. Um, we see 
um, people using the idea of uh, women's safety and queer people's safety um, as uh, something to be respected or something to be um, protected over the, u over the need of, for example, racialized uh, communities' needs for safety. And they do not understand that we need to think intersectionally. Uh, there are Jewish people of color, there are lesbian Muslim women with headscarves, uh, there are um, uh, you know, all kinds of identities that we share and that are intersectionally connected and that deserve safety as well. And where it is impossible, um, it's not realistic, it's not in solidarity with each other to try to pit these safety needs against each other. We see, um, for example, in Germany, um, the creation, we're observing a creation of a certain white agenda where women's rights, uh, queer rights, um, and also Jewish people's uh, needs for safety are pitting, are created, are, are constructed into a white agenda in order to differentiate between uh, them and, for example, Muslim people, brown people, um, um, Arabs, Turks, Kurdish people, uh, Persian people, uh, they're not included into this, into this idea that there's ne a need for safety um, of, these, um, of these communities as well. And they are portrayed, for instance, as more sexist, more homophobic, um, more anti-Semitic than the white German communities. And we consider this to be part of a so-called clash of civilization, a war of civilization, um, which intends to portray in a particular Muslim communities as uh, backwards and their culture as uncivilized and therefore not deserving, um, not deserving uh, protection from violence and punishment. And um, just as a footnote, uh, we are observing this at the moment, but of course this has a very long colonial history and fascist legacy known in particular in Germany, um, but also in Europe in general. So, in fact, we would like to point out one particular thing that comes to us when we thought about this, um, pitting communities against each other um, and exploiting their needs of safety against another community. Um, in this tent tonight, or this afternoon, there was, um, there was another plan. There was, um, w there was a plan to have a panel um, of people discussing cultural boycott of Israel and the movement, um, the Palestinian movement um, of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. And uh, this panel uh, was canceled and uh, it was censored. Um, and the organizers of this tent canceled it um, in order, like with the idea of this event would have um, harmed needs uh, safety needs of the Jewish community. And we do not believe that this is the right way um, of discussing uh, these very pressing uh, topics. Um, and so we're, we're saddened about this. And yet there is an event, there was an event in this tent about anti-Semitism, and we see that one marginalized group is played against another one, and this is a divide and conquer strategy that we do not support. Women against people of color or Jewish people against Muslim people. We refuse to accept this because we all exist intersectionally. There are Muslim women of color, there are Jews of color, and so on. And because we know that we have to fight our true enemy, which is not other marginalized people. Racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, capitalism, they are all part of the same network of oppression. And to overcome this, uh, we need strong communities and we need solidarity. Thank you, Nadia. So, um, the activists that I was talking about before in the US who, uh, a lot of these people were working at the intersections of two different movements. The BDS panel? It was already today. We can talk about it. It's not our topic today, so that's fine. Um, 
So these activists uh, who were making this intervention into these two movements and talking about how they both kind of need each other have been developing alternatives um, to state violence, particularly for addressing uh, sexual violence and partner violence. So for those people uh, who can't or don't want to bring the state in when they experience uh, sexual violence in their life. Um, and a lot of these alternatives are very experimental. They're happening in friend groups. They're happening in house projects. They're happening in small organizations. There's a lot of different strategies and a lot of different methods. So I can't, you know, I can't like represent the movement, um, but I can speak about some of the principles and the ideas that motivate those experiments um, and try to bring them together. So some of the main, uh, you know, the, a lot of when these activists were looking for alternatives, like how can we deal with violence and conflict without doing the punishment thing, without doing the state thing, uh, part of where they looked was to indigenous justice systems. So they were looking at um, the ways that uh, indigenous people in North America um, would uh, create accountability circles when harm had happened in their communities. Or they were looking at, you know, concepts in sub-Saharan Africa around Ubuntu, which is the idea that, you know, we are all connected to one another. We all uh, exist in interconnection. And a lot of these strategies have become popularized now as uh, quote-unquote restorative justice. Have any of you ever heard of restorative justice before? You would just put a hand up. Yeah. Some of these, uh, there are some promising practices in restorative justice. Um, but a lot of restorative justice has actually become, especially in the US, the UK, and Australia, kind of co-opted. And it's become a way for the state to put certain cases, especially cases involving young people and juveniles, into kind of a separate system um, that's more focused on conflict mediation and reparation of harm. Um, and the other problem with restorative justice that these activists found when they were trying to look around for alternatives is that the concept of restoring is uh, sort of this idea that we have to restore something that's been broken. We have to uh, go back to some previous state of harmony. But what transformative justice activists were recognizing is that we actually live in a world where we've never had justice, uh, and a lot of relationships have always been broken or always been in a state of harm or oppression. And so we, we can't just like fix individual relationships. We need to get to the root of the problem which are structural conditions that actually make uh, interpersonal violence possible. And that's, we skipped over that, but I think we always have to, we use a model from an organization in Berlin called Les Migras, which is the anti-discrimination office, um, uh, like section of the Lesbenberatung in Berlin. And they really talk about how we have to understand violence as interconnected. So we always have to understand interpersonal violence as happening within a context, a broader context of structural violence, state violence, institutional violence. So we actually can't talk about that inner circle without thinking about, you know, if the person who caused harm, uh, what is their visa status, right? How are they treated on the streets? What forms of oppression are they experiencing in their life? Um, are they experiencing transphobia? How does that play into the interpersonal relationships uh, and the interpersonal harm that's going on? All right, I won't, sorry. <laughs> I just, uh, I don't know how much, I don't know, we're already low on time. That one is good, yeah. So some of the principles that I wanna, um, I want to, to ground this work in, and I'm drawing here on an organization whose name is at the bottom there, Generation Five, an organization from the Bay Area. Um, some of their core principles are, uh, first, that everyone can cause and experience harm, uh, regardless of their position in society. Although we know your position in society may make you much more vulnerable to experiencing harm or much more likely uh, to cause harm to others, right? So that goes back to these circles that I was talking about, that we have to think about all of these systems together uh, in order to pull apart what's really going on. Uh, and part of, I think, part of the sort of universalism of this moment of saying everyone can cause and experience harm is to say that we have to get beyond this um, good, evil, uh, moral binary, that there are like good people and bad people, there are the bad perpetrators and the good victims, and really understand that we're actually kind of moving in a messy world where we all have, we all have the experience of both causing and being harmed, right? 
Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of the way that that punishment system from the state works is through a very moral, like a very moral vocabulary of telling us that we're, we are you know, bad. We have some, something morally wrong with us if we've caused harm. And we really wanna shift away from that and understand harm as not something that has to do with some deep part of your soul, but actually harm and violence are the vocabulary of our society. It's like a language that we learn when we come into this world. It's the way that people exercise power and actually get their needs met in our society. So that's what we have to change, right? If we can learn violence, then the idea is that we can also unlearn it. Um, the second one is, and this is coming very much out of um, Black Lives Matter, out of the experience of black communities in the US being uh, experiencing mass incarceration that was destroying their communities, is the idea that no one is disposable. Even if somebody has caused harm, that doesn't mean that we need to throw them away forever, right? Everyone deserves connection. Now, this is also nuanced. This doesn't mean that I have to be friends with uh, my ex-partner who abused me. That doesn't, that's not what we're saying. We're not forcing people to be in relation to each other, uh, like specific people. But we are saying that what we wanna see are communities that can hold people, even people who've caused harm, and help them try to change. Um, and uh, a third principle is centering and empowering those who've been most harmed and most marginalized uh, and putting their needs at the center. Um, a lot of legal models for addressing harm don't really deal with what the survivor wants. Um, they just focus on what the law says. Um, and the last principle is that individual justice and social justice are mutually dependent. So justice in an individual case uh, for instance, in my case where I experienced violence from my partner, I can't have my individual justice without also thinking about and working on broader social justice issues, right? That those two things are bound up in each other. Um, so I wanna, I think we're kind of low on time, but I wanna ask you guys two questions and I think because we're running low on time, I'm gonna ask you to just do these in your head and not talk to your partner. You can talk to your partner or your neighbor after um, so I want you to think first about, uh, we use this word accountability a lot, and I want to think about um, what did you learn as a young person growing up about accountability? Did people around you, when you were a kid, take accountability if they did something hurtful or harmful? And if so, how? Okay, I'll let all your little brains work. So I'm gonna say, I, I've heard a lot of different answers to this. Uh, this is a really rich question, so you can talk about this at dinner or whatever, but some of the common answers are that what people learned about accountability growing up as children was that powerful people never took accountability when they did something wrong. I, you know, did your teachers ever say sorry? Did your parents ever say sorry? For some people, that never happened. Um, other, another common answer is that people were often forced to apologize or say they were sorry, no matter how they felt. It was just a performance. It was like, okay, I'm sorry, uh, move on. And what a lot of people have also said is the idea that the weaker person in a, in a constellation or a relationship is the one who has to say they're sorry. They're the one who has to be accountable. And actually saying you're sorry is kind of like losing the game, right? If you're in a fight with your sibling and then your parent makes you apologize, it's like, okay, well, I lost the toy. It's over, game over. So obviously we wanna think about a different concept of accountability than this. And so for that, I'm gonna ask you guys to do one more thought experiment in your brains. I, if everyone will close their eyes, just humor me. Uh, I want to think of, I want you to think about a time that somebody has harmed you. D don't think about, don't think about the worst ever. Think about something small that you can handle. It's not going to upset you. And think about what you would have needed from that person in order to make that situation right again. What kind of accountability, responsibility, what would you have needed? What would that have looked like? So take a moment on that. We can flip this.
All right, I'm sorry to have to cut this short. You can continue fantasizing about your dream apology situation later. Um, but I want to I want to think about comparing that form of accountability we learned as as kids and we learned from the system to what people often describe that they really need when harm happens to them and the kind of accountability they really need in their lives. So that's sort of why we have two columns here. So the traditional sort of legal format, you know, harm is about breaking a law and or breaking a rule. And transformative justice wants to reframe that and say that that what we're talking about is actually harming a relationship or harming a person. And you know, accountability in this traditional form is like an exercise of power. Somebody gets to decide who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad. And we want to shift to say that we want to exercise interrelationship with one another rather than power over each other. And we, what we need rather than some moral decision is we need to recognize harm, we need to repair it, and then we need to prevent it from happening again. That's where also the bigger picture stuff comes in about addressing the structural conditions that teach certain people to use violence. And rather than like a quick fake apology from your sibling, what most people really need when they experience vi violence is like deep listening and recognition of what's happened to them. And you know, our traditional, uh, like very Christian punishment model is this eye for an eye, just deserts, you get what you deserve, punishment model. And transformative justice is asking us to think about something else and to think about uh, what would it look like to reflect and to take action to fix the harm and to change those harmful behaviors and those harmful conditions that led to it happening. So right now I'm being super vague, so I'm gonna try to get a little more specific about what we mean. This is very much like an intro to a complex topic. Um, a group called Insight, Women, Gender, Nonconforming, and Trans People of Color Against Violence, they coined this term, community accountability. Um, and they started to talk about, you know, what would it mean, these, all these principles we've been talking about, what would it look like to actually do that? Like, how do we do that? And their vision of how we do that involves four different, like, areas or bubbles and talks about the things that we can do in each of those bubbles. And they're all interrelated. They're part of creating this community accountability. And part of why we talk about the community is that if, we, if we're moving away from the state, we're moving towards the community as the place where accountability can happen or where people can get into right relationship with each other. So the first and I think one of the most important bubbles is survivors. So talk about how can we do collective support for survivors. Remember, we're not talking about paternalism. I'm going to tell you what you need. I'm going to protect you. We're talking actually about survivors having self-determination, being able to choose and envision what they need to, to heal. Um, what this might look like, well, there's a lot of groups in Germany that actually already do this very well, that get together when harm has happened in the community and uh, work together with a survivor in supporting that person. And that support might be emotional, but it also might be, I'm going to babysit your kids. I'm going to make you dinner. Uh, I'm gonna go with you to this office and help you fill out this paper, right? And this is work that um, it's not sexy, it's not exciting. Most people are like, yeah, fuck the police, but they don't wanna actually do the support work. It's mostly the femme work, it's the emotional, gendered labor, um, but this is some of the most important stuff, right? On the other side is working with people who've caused harm. We use that term instead of perpetrators because we want to talk about behaviors, not like identity, right? So we want to think about behavior, not like you're stamped forever as a terrible person. Um, and here we're talking about processes with people who've caused harm to get them to fix what they've done and to get them to change. This shit is really complicated. I've been involved in some of these processes. You can come talk to me about them. They're very, very complex and difficult. It's hard to do it right. People are trying, and I give them a lot of credit for that. Um, some of the easier stuff, or not easier, but different stuff to do is also working on the community and the broader political structure level, right? So uh, if, a, if an act of sexual violence happens in your house project, you might ask yourself, what are our norms and values that led to that situation happening? Are we having parties with a lot of alcohol and not keeping an eye on each other 
and not looking out for who might be vulnerable to sexual violence in that situation? Can we create an awareness structure to take better care of each other? Do we have, are we seeing a, a couple that's in a relationship that's unhealthy or maybe abusive and all of us are too f afraid to actually ask them what's going on and to find out more, right? Because as a house or as a political group, we don't wanna get involved, right? So what would it mean to actually get together as a group, sit down and say, hey, we kind of have a problem. Uh, I know that we're spending all of our time organizing on this great campaign, but actually there are two people in our group who look like they're really, one of them is really hurting the other one. We need to deal with that as well, right? And this political structure stuff is about changing the conditions that allow violence to happen. So I, one great example, I was just in London, there's an organization there called Sisters Uncut. Uh, they're fighting austerity measures from Theresa May's government that's cutting funding for um, domestic violence shelters. And one of the things that they do is talk about uh, affordable housing and that a lot of women can't leave abusive relationships because they have nowhere to go, they have nowhere to live. And so what they've done is actually occupy buildings to create more space for women who need to leave abusive relationships where they can live, right? All right, I think we gotta go. <laughs> How, do we have 10 minutes left? Yeah. Okay. Should we take questions? No, it's okay. You good? Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Sorry, team. We have like about 10 minutes left. I'm wondering if there are. Um, well, okay, I will say this. Um, this stuff is hard. If you wanna do it, come talk to me. It's really important. Um, and we also know that you know this is just the beginning. So we're talking a lot about um, harm that's happening in our communities. I don't have a model for you know getting rid of police and prisons and then what are we gonna do with the corporations that pollute all of our rivers or harm people? What are we gonna do with states when they cause harm? I don't have the answers to that yet. Uh, but I do know that um, one thing that we talked about is, you know, we have a culture uh, in, the, in the US, we call this calling out. We have a culture when someone does something wrong of like pointing it out publicly in order to like humiliate them or shame them. Um, I think calling out can be useful, especially if you're calling out somebody who doesn't wanna listen or who's very powerful. You wanna point it out in the public that what they're doing is fucked up. But when we're dealing with each other, with people that we think, hey, you're part of my community, I feel like we share values, I feel like we share vision, maybe we can turn away from calling out towards uh, this concept of calling in, which is not my concept, it's a concept from somebody whose name I actually can't remember right now and I feel bad about, but a really awesome Asian American activist from the US. If you Google calling in, you will find their name. Um, and that's actually part of why we made the statement earlier about, um, you know, we wanted to reflect on what was happening in this tent and about the event that was canceled because we actually, we, want, we didn't want to call out, we didn't do that to shame the program organizers. It was actually, we wanted to call them in and say, we see this as a problem. We want to engage you with a di in dialogue about this, right? So that's sort of the approach that, that we're taking here. I think we often talk about community accountability for these like, huge, really painful cases of sexual violence, partner violence, but it's something you can start really small, right? So calling in is something you can do in a really small way when really like small situations ha of harm happen, right? Where you can intervene and um, rather than ignoring something and saying it's not my problem or just telling someone to fuck off, you can actually try to engage them in a relationship and in a conversation. I'm not saying that that's gonna work necessarily, but I just wanna invite you to try it. Um, and we have like five minutes, so I feel like we could take a question. A question? Is there a question? Hi. Do you agree that part of the problem for all this to arise is that people don't see that punishment is actually a form of revenge? and that most people think we live in a society where we don't have revenge anymore, and they don't see that, like in the States, punishment is m to a much higher degree used as revenge as it is in Norway, and in Norway, 
people, people put to prison and about 80% don't come back because prison is used as a way to help people. Those who are, are in prison are seen as victims themselves that need help. Um, so if I got you correctly, maybe you're referring to a concept um, of reintegration or resocialization. Is that because that's, the, that's what's big in Norway? In the beginning, you said the whole reason for all of this were um, that people want to oppress some groups. And I see it, the whole basic reason that lies even further is that we haven't, um, ha have, don't have this understanding on in the society that revenge and punishment is the same thing. And that it's never okay with revenge or punishment. And of course it's okay to say stop and do what you need to protect, but to protect and not to punish or do revenge. And then you, it plays out on these different minorities because it's easier with them. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, thank you. That was a question as far as I understood about revenge. So I think there's a lot of different theories about why we live in such a punitive society. If it has to do with like a, dr a human drive towards revenge, if it has to do with racialized capitalism, all those things together. Um, Revenge is a great topic. I have a lot to say about it. Also the line between self-defense and revenge. Um, but I appreciate you bringing that up. I think it takes a lot of, of community support and emotional resources to get over our desire to get revenge on the people who hurt us. Um, but I personally have experienced it as liberating to get love and support from the people who love me rather than focus on getting something from someone who will never you know, I'll never really get anything from, so. <laughs> yeah, true, one more question. Yeah? Uh, you told us that you don't really have an idea how we can kind of abolish the state or all these institutions that we have right now, but don't we need a kind of powerful institution that is able to um, handle powerful companies? Because if you don't have any inequality uh, between these institutions, we'll never be able kind of to follow them over the world because companies are not in one um, nation. They're all over the world. So don't we need a kind of institution that is able to uh, punish or to, to see what a company is doing all over the world. Yeah. When I said I don't, I wasn't being fully honest when I said I don't know how, how we're going to abolish uh, the state. I have some thoughts. We all have some thoughts. We can talk about this for a long time. I think what, what you're getting at is that we need to think strategically. Um, what I'm trying to point out is that there are just limits to this model. This model was really built for communities. It wasn't built for that situation that you're talking about. And I think it's great to brainstorm what we can build for those cases. It's also interesting that you bring it up because that's a debate that we are having. I think, Mel, you're used to the idea of state that is being debated in the US where people are demanding more state in terms of welfare system and stuff, whereas I'm politicized in Germany where pushing back against a very authoritarian, repressive state is, is part of my political agenda. And um, we, have to, uh, we have to think about what is the state. I mean, we are living in a, in a period where neoliberal capitalism um, is uh, everywhere and has um, formed our idea of the state, which is a very, um, very tiny, not very present state for instance companies, um, but a very present and authoritarian state for activists and marginalized communities. All right, I think we gotta wrap up. I did want to uh, give you all of our info so you can stay in touch with us. So this is our email address for the Transformative Justice Collective, which is located in Berlin. Uh, you can download the book here. You can also order it from Edition Assemblage. 
Uh, you can find us on Facebook and on Twitter, and we're also really encouraging people when you're doing your little sci-fi brainstorms about what is that world where you feel really safe and what would get you there, what, do you, what would you need? Rather than borders and prisons, what would it be? Um, we invite you to post so and tag us, so we're using the hashtags really safe and wirklich sicher. Um, and yeah, just come talk to us after the event. <laughs>